Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina, an incredible podcast coming up with Peter Rupert, UCSB economist. And he's talking about all the latest trends, particularly what he mentioned at the state of the county meeting last week, which was about retail and why Santa Barbara is struggling so much worse than Ventura and San Luis Obispo. So we're going to talk about housing and so many things, retail, the economy, inflation, recession, trends that's coming up. I wanted to thank everybody for watching this podcast and ask you to please subscribe, hit the subscribe button. I'm at 404 subscribers as of this recording, and I'm really trying to boost the number because I'm trying to expand and reach more people. And the more people who subscribe increases my ability for monetization and to reach out and talk to uh, new audiences. And that's sort of the goal, to bring all this incredible content that the community of Santa Barbara shares on this show. So thank you so much. I want to give a shout out as well to Don Lubach, who put a really nice uh, suggestion on his Facebook page to uh, subscribe. And I really appreciate it. It was really helpful. Got a bunch of uh, subscribers for me. So thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone who watches. So go ahead and hit subscribe on YouTube. Uh, please tell somebody, share the podcast with a friend. Still a majority of people who watch are not regular subscribers. So if we can actually get the number of people who watch the podcast, which is a lot of people to subscribe, those numbers are going to jump up. And if you're so inclined, visit SantaBarbaraTalks.com and make a contribution. Uh, this is podcast is owned by me and I run everything and I schedule it all on my own time. And uh, it's an incredible venture that I'm trying to do here in this community to facilitate these really incredible conversations among a wide variety of sources and people and individuals so people can come together from all walks of life and have this great conversation about the things we care about, housing and transportation and education and business and culture and these things that thread our community no matter where we stand so thank you so much i appreciate your time enjoy this podcast with peter rupert and uh thanks a lot take care welcome to santa barbara talks with josh molina and it's such a pleasure today to be here with one of my favorite guests and one of the smartest people around in a lot of issues. And today we're going to talk about economics and the state of the county coming off a presentation you recently gave. UCSB economist Peter Rupert, how are you doing today? Great, Josh. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, good, and good. I always enjoy talking to you, whether it's, you know, like this format or just a conversation for a news story or whatever else. Uh, I always learn a lot. And I know our re our viewers are in store here for a treat. So, uh, Peter, you were at the State of the County presentation uh, last week. Uh, a lot of the county officials were there. And uh, it's an opportunity to touch base, broad brush strokes on what's happening in a lot of different areas as it relates to housing and, and employment and retail trends and employ, you know, all these things that we care about and talk about. So I wanted to dive a little bit deeper here today with you. And one of the things that struck me from what I heard of your presentation, as well as some uh, slides that you shared with me was this issue with retail. Now we, we are always hearing about the death of, of, uh, of retail, about Amazon, about how Santa Barbara is struggling to fill their storefronts downtown, La Cumbre Plaza, kind of all, all over, you know, in South Coast. And then you show these slides that sort of say that retail is actually doing way better in Ventura County. So can we talk about what's going on and why that is? Yeah, it's very interesting, Josh. I I look at a lot of data and, you know, sometimes things really jump out at you and sometimes, you know, it's like, okay, okay, you know, but but this, uh, you know, I never really graphed these this way before. And so I just grabbed like leisure and hospitality employment and retail employment going back to 1990. And I did that in Santa Barbara County and, and Ventura County. And actually yesterday I did it for, for San Luis Obispo as well. But so first I'll talk about Ventura a little bit. So, so Ventura basically retail employment had always been higher, you know, maybe 5,000 to 8,000 people higher than, uh, uh, than leisure and hospitality. And they both grew at about the same rate until the Great Recession 
then retail kind of slowed down, but just slowed down. It didn't decline. And then leisure and hospitality kept growing, growing, growing. And now they're about the same equal in terms of employment. So leisure and hospitality relative to, to, to retail has been, has been growing a lot. I looked at Santa Barbara County and I mean, I was just astounded that starting in 1990, leisure and hospitality and retail were about the same level, you know, around 16,000 in each sector, growing at the same rate for about 15 years. Okay, so they looked about the same. They're, the lines are right on top of each other. And then in 2000, um, all of a sudden retail just stopped. And right now, and then and leisure and hospitality kept growing, growing, growing. Leisure and hospitality is almost double what it was back in, in 2000. Um, and right now, retail is the lowest level ever recorded since 1990. It just sank, you know, and it, it sank during the Great Recession. <clears throat> and it sank again, obviously, during the pandemic. But it just has never come back. And, you know, it's just very, very strange. And then I did it for San Luis Obispo. <clears throat> San Luis Obispo looks a little bit like, like <clears throat> Santa Barbara except it didn't start declining till about 2008. And it's still higher than it was back in 1990, but Santa Barbara just fell off the map. I mean, it's crazy. Now, you know, you know, having said that, you know, when you look at data and you look at, for example, our neighbors like Ventura mm -hmm. or, or San Luis Obispo, there's not a lot of difference. I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of on the coast, um, you know, housing prices are a little bit lower, obviously in Ventura than here. Um, but you'd think that things should look similar and they don't. So, so to me, you know, people say, well, you know, it's the internet. Well, I think Ventura gets the internet too, don't they? <laughs> I, I think most of <laughs> it, yeah. most of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, online shopping, you know, everybody has the opportunity to do online shopping. So that can't be the explanation. Um, the explanation has to be something, you know, maybe more structural about, about Santa Barbara and, you know, I think just if you look at just a micro at the micro level and you do this more than I, I think, you know, walking down state street, state street used to have retail. Yeah. Now it's very, very little retail relative to food and accommodate food, right. And accommodation. So, so we might be just be seeing a very structural change in, in what Santa Barbara is going through. You know, is it going to last, you know, who knows? Is it anything about policy? I haven't looked into that yet, but, um, you know, do we have different rules and regulations and permitting than, than Ventura or San Luis Obispo? Could be, could mm -hmm. be. Yeah, I think it's a variety of factors, probably. What about this idea that there's a nexus to housing? So if we don't have people living in Santa Barbara, uh, working class, middle class, lower income individuals, the people who... Um, support the economy if they can't find places to live here therefore they're not going to shop here and so businesses aren't going to do as well retail shops are not going to do as well because a lot of people might be just coming into work and then leaving and then doing their shopping wherever they're coming from whether it's santa maria or or, or ventura or wherever is that is that a thing is that possible possible no, I, I, I think it is. But, you know, again, you know, if we, if we go back and look at, you know, the growth in housing prices, I mean, I, I think that, you know, Santa Barbara, Ventura, you know, San Luis Obispo, I, I haven't really looked too deeply at the growth rate in those other counties. But, you know, I can't imagine they'd be too much different. I mean, these are very, you know, great places to live. And, you know, so relatively speaking, you know, um, housing prices in, in Santa Barbara have probably always been higher than Ventura, mm -hmm. you know, is my guess, you know, so, so that, that level effect, you know, to me, it says, okay, that's always been there. Yeah. So why is all of a sudden in 2000, the things, you know, kind of fall apart. Um, so like I said, I haven't really looked into, into the explanations for that yet. I, I think that to me, you know, when I saw that these data, it was just like, wow, that's crazy. And so I think that, you know, that's an area where we, we really need to, you know, to figure out what's, what's happening there. Now, look, if it's the fact that people want, you know, restaurants rather than, than retail shopping, and it's, it's, and that's what we feel like, and that's what we want, that's fine. But like you said, if it's because we can't afford 
you know, to hire people to live here. Um, you know, that's something that, that we really need to work on. Yeah. And I can tell you, I live in Goleta in Camino Real Marketplace, which I'm sure you go to. Mm-hmm. It's kind of really amazing how, how uh, many people there are all the time, how busy, all the time. vibrant, you know, sometimes you got, you know, if you're going to one side, there's no parking space on that side. So you got to park by Home Depot and sort of walk over <laughs> to the Starbucks or right. something. Um, very busy, very different experience than being on uh, State Street or Lacumbre Plaza. And so there are there are no clear answers here as to why something can be so doing so much better than another place. I mean, somebody could say, oh, well, Camino Real is private property and it's enclosed and it's not as long public area like State Street. And, you know, all of that is true, but uh, it's just an entirely different experience in some parts. And Galena and Santa Barbara are, are not that different. I mean, it's, it's I, a road. I agree. You know? I agree. I mean, yeah, no, look, I think that's right. I think the experience is much, much different. I mean, going to State Street now is, you know, kind of walking up and down and, you know, maybe stopping for, you know, a beer or a glass of wine or something. Um, you know, if, if you're going to, to Goleta, you know, and you're going to Camino Marketplace, by the way, I was there yet yesterday and, you know, I was trying to make a left turn to get to get back onto Stork off of, you know, I'm in the parking lot. I couldn't make a left turn. There were so many cars going. Yeah. I just couldn't make a left turn to get. So I had to basically make a right turn and then come back and make another right turn. So it was completely jam packed, you know. Tactic. So, yeah. so it, it is a much much different experience. Um, and I think you know, as you know, the the you know the the people that are looking into State Street, you know, they know it's long. They know that the store the storefronts are not you know really conducive to to that kind of shopping, you know. So. You know, I don't know what they're going to come up with, but, you know, I keep saying that, you know, I think the idea of closing State Street to cars, to me, that's not the biggest issue. I mean, I've been in many cities. I was just in Istanbul not too too long ago. And like this little street in this little area, it's jam-packed with cars. The road isn't closed. Every place has tables on the sidewalk. And people figure out how to go get by them. You know what I mean? They, mm-hmm. they figured it out. And so mm-hmm. there's really no rules or regulations there. Yeah. And people have kind of figured out people want to be sitting on the street. They want to be outside. And there's cars. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to me, it's more about, you know, how do we get people to be eating and drinking outside? Which to me, that's what Santa Barbara should be all about, right? Yeah. And, you know, before the pandemic, there weren't very many places to eat outdoors, you know, along State Street. Right. Or anywhere. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, so look, I think it's a it's a great great thing. You know, I think it's really going to change the nature of what we do when people are outside eating and drinking, and you know, it's going to be more conducive to tourists. Um, so, yeah, I love the fact of eating outside. No doubt about it. Um, we just have to figure out how to how to do that on a, on a street like State Street. Yeah. And is there a a layer or thread to what you're saying that I'm picking up on that maybe government could do a better job. The city of Santa Barbara possibly could do a better job of facilitating uh, retail establishments in terms of people wanting to come in and permitting and uh, things that, that the city requires to be done before they can open up. This is not yeah. a retail place, but we look at the uh, Aloha uh, Santa, the, the, the skating rink that was supposed to go up and they announced with a lot of fanfare a year ago and then they never did open. And there's a lot of, I don't have all the answers there, but there were things in terms of permits that the state required. They did not feel as though they knew when they opened up and the city also required things and it never happened. And so now it's nothing and going to be office space at some point but is there a an element here that you could say is hey santa barbara needs to make this happen just as much as the private sector yeah no i no doubt about that and you know i think if you go back and look at you know what's happening in the funk zone Mm -hmm. you know i mean you know more about this than i do but i don't think anyone came in and said we're gonna plan to have the funk zone look like it is i think it just grew kind of you know you know endogenously and people were like hey this is a fun place to go it's compact you know all of a sudden you know how many wineries are down there now i have no idea i mean 
you know, and then that, that's expanding a little bit, right? So you go over to like where third window is and, you know, so that's hopping. There's a line out the door most times. I mean, you know, so I, I, I met with some realtors and uh, someone on the council um, not too long ago. And the council member said to the realtors, you know, what can we do? And, you know, we need housing, we need whatever. And it, it was so interesting. He, it, the council member said, give me a laundry list of things that council can do to help facilitate this stuff. And the realtor said, we're not giving you a laundry list. We're going to give you one thing. Guaranteed permitting. Mm -hmm. Within 18 months, mm -hmm. which seems like a long time to me, by the way. But, yeah. you know, they said, just guarantee that. Because what we're seeing now is, you know, that, that you know, whatever happens, um, they have a plan. It goes through the account. It goes through the you know, planning. And then it's like, okay, we want to see this changed. And then they have another 90 days. Mm -hmm. right and then it's like now we want to see this change and this change so you know what they say is you know we come in with the plan we think it's you know could be permitted in you know in 18 months and it's three years or maybe four years it's just random and one of the projects you know that was planned you know they had to do some borrowing and the borrowing was you know they had funding at like 3.5 percent interest or something but it took so long for this project to, to to go through everything two or three years all of a sudden interest rates are four and a half or five percent mm -hmm. and they're like now it doesn't pencil out project done so you know it's not so much you know you know facilitating you know in terms of like you know giving subsidies or grants or whatever but but to me it's more like you know you know let's tell these you know these developers or or, or store owners you know when you want to expand you're going to get an answer within you know a year you know, and if we don't do it in a year, you got it. You know, if we, can, you know what I mean. So, I think having some real certainty out there is to, you know, when people make plans, they want to know, you know, when can this be done, and if it's just random, you know. So, one other part of that, the realtors told me that they have some property. I think it's in Huntsville, Alabama, and it's like the fastest growing area now. And what they said was, a developer comes in. Um, the city has has set aside some areas they want developed. And they said, if you're going to develop in that area, we're going to permit you in 90 days. Done deal. Right. Developers are flocking there. They're like, okay, you know, we can get this done in 90 days. You know, just think about it. You're investing a bunch of money. And if you're not getting any return for three, four, five years, you know, you're putting a lot of pressure on, on, on developers. So, so to me, I mean, that would be, you know, give us a guarantee. Um, you know, when this thing will be done and, you know, we'll come in. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think that's, it goes to that collision you have with urban planners. Uh, they go to school, uh, they learn, they're skilled, uh, they know what they're doing, but their job is to plan a community and they're getting guaranteed uh, paychecks from the government, yeah. no matter how long things take. And of course, they're understaffed and they have their own challenges within government that the private sector doesn't understand. But the truth is, is it's a lot easier to uh, put people through a process when you're guaranteed to get your paycheck and not understand that these other businesses, yes, you know, everyone thinks they're rich and all this stuff, but they're borrowing massive amounts of money and they're investing and then they're waiting to get a payback and if they don't they're it's a it's even a much more perilous situation because it's more money's at stake and so uh it's it's a it's a game that is plays out all the time and i don't think both right. sides understand each other and uh that's you know that's why where landlords come in property owners you know the good ones mm -hmm. will figure out a way to lower rent you know during this period but but then property managers aren't in the business to do charity work they're, they're in the business right. to, to make money too so it's this triangle here and it's really difficult exactly. for everyone's needs to be met at the same time um the other thing that you talked about at your presentation was housing and a year ago a little year and a half ago everybody was talking about the incredible soaring housing market and how these homes were skyrocketing in value and I don't know that we're at that place anymore. Can you can you talk to me about what's going on? 
yeah i so you're right i mean and i think everyone knows or should know that you know housing prices cannot increase at you know at one point they were increasing like you know 10 15 percent a month you know but but you know overall they were doing something like 20 percent a year um that's not sustainable How, you know it's just not sustainable you know that's housing prices have never grown at that rate for very long and so you know if you said to me you know look housing prices are going at 20 percent you know i would say okay they're going to fall at some point they just can't be so a couple things i think the pandemic has really changed a lot i think we're starting to, to you know people have sort of sorted themselves out now after the pandemic uh, where they want to live um, you know, I think the people from coming from San Francisco or LA, you've heard those stories too, that they were coming with cash, you know, houses were, were selling for, you know, 50% over asking price, whatever, go, gone in a week, a day. Yeah. Um, that's certainly slowed down. No doubt about that. And, you know, one should expect, you know, growth rates and housing prices, you know, on average to be, you know, something like five, 6%. I mean, that's what, you know, if you look at the return on real assets, um, that's what it looks like. So, so I think that it was obvious it was going to slow down, and it has. Number two, you know, mortgage rates are now the highest they've been in you know twenty or thirty years. Um, you know, up around six percent. Um, and by the way, you know, if you listen to what the Fed says, they're going to keep increasing, uh, maybe a couple more times. Uh, so that short rate, which affects the, the longer mortgage rate, you know, it'll it'll continue to rise a bit. You know, I hear a lot of 30 somethings, late 20s people complain, <laughs> um, gripe, <laughs> do their social media memes, you know, share something about how we can't afford to buy a home. Uh, the previous generations, it was much easier for them to buy a home, and we can't, and we're never going to be able to. And home ownership is out of reach. And there's this sense of they're the first generation that's ever had to deal with this. And so, you know, maybe yeah. it's the worst it's ever been. Um, that's why I'm asking you, but what do you say to that approach, that attitude? Obviously you're at the university, you, you hear so a lot of that. Um, was that fair? I mean, can we just say, Hey, you guys screwed it up and now we can't buy a home. Uh, talk to me about your reaction yeah. to that sentiment. Yeah. So, Look, at the university, we face this, you know, big time. I mean, it's very, very hard for us to hire new faculty. There's just no doubt about it. And, you know, it, it's fairly easy, I guess, to hire like a single individual, mm -hmm. you know, who can come in and live in a, you know, one or two bedroom apartment and, uh, you know, but, but, you know, you know, trying to hire, you know, a faculty member with kids, um, you know, a spouse and kids. You know, I hear it all the time from them, like, you know, no. And it's not like we pay exorbitant salaries, you know, because our our housing stock is is expensive. We just can't do that, you know. So so I do hear it all the time. Do I think it's the first time ever? You know, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's obviously true in Santa Barbara. A friend of mine just he, he teaches at the Florida State University uh, in math. Bought a brand new house, three bedroom, brand new yard, you know, 300,000. <laughs> so, right. you know, <laughs> you know, you want to live in Santa Barbara as, as everybody does. And they're always going to. Um, it's expensive here. And, you know, we have lots and lots of issues that, that many other places don't have. I mean, you know, we're very constrained. Uh, you know, we have the ocean, national forest, ag land. You know, and, and I think you've heard recently about the new uh, regional housing needs assessment people, the RENA people, um, you know, where the state says that you guys better get your act together. You know, before there was really no teeth into the RENA numbers. It was like, you know, the state comes out and says, you guys need to have 3,000 more houses or 5,000, whatever the number is. And we're like, okay, sounds good. We'll, we'll get it done. Thank you. And then, you know, a few years later, the same thing happens. But now... I guess they're, they're thinking there's going to be some more teeth to that. But, you know, I think this issue, you know, on the one hand, people are saying we have no water. On the other hand, people are saying we need 5,000 more houses. Mm -hmm. And those two things don't go together to me unless we do something else. Right. So, so I, I think, you know, housing is always going to be expensive here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
if we build three or 400 houses, is that going to put a dent really in the supply of houses to lower the price? Not much, not much. And I think we've seen that in several instances, like, you know, when the mark was, was first planned and being built, people thought it would be like for the close to the missing middle. Mm -hmm. And now one bedroom and two bedroom places are 3000 or 3,500. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I just saw a very interesting, um, there's a website that's, it's, it's from MIT that what they do is they calculate um, uh, cost of living and they go through all kinds of things about, you know, what would a living wage be? And, you know, so the growth in that is pretty much outpaced wage growth. Now, recently wage growth is very high. It's the highest it's been in a couple of decades. So wages are growing maybe four or four and a half percent a year. Um, this last, um, this last Friday, uh, yesterday, you know, the employment report came out and, and wages were growing around six to 7%. Mm. The problem is inflation is higher than that. Mm. So even though wages are growing, you know, their, their real incomes are falling. And so, you know, what that really means is we're becoming poorer. And so if you look at this living wage, so I just happened to look at it, let's see. So for Santa Barbara, they're saying with two adults who are both working, um, the cost of living before is $122,000. Now, as you know, you know, restaurant workers, um, retail workers, they're not getting 122,000 a year. Right. So, so, you know, that that's an area where, you know, unfortunately they, they can't live here. The second problem is, you know, commuting is also very difficult, you know, and, I don't know how much you drive down towards South. Um, but, you know, in the, starting at three o'clock in the afternoon, it's just yeah. a nightmare. Right. You know, it's just, and, you know, and I think as you were talking with Jerry the other day, um, you know, we got a 50 year project going on. It's going to be horrible for, for a long, long time. So, right. you know, it turns out in places like Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Paris, San Francisco, New York, um, most people can't live in the rich part of the city, right. right? Downtown London, you know, it's unbelievable how expensive it is, but they have public transportation. So in 30 or 40 minutes, people can live far out, you know, and, and, and come in. Um, you know, I think obviously going south is hard. Maybe going north is, is a little better. Um, and I think that we're going to start seeing some, you know, a lot more building up there, but in but right now there are very, very few projects, you know, penciled in to, um, to kind of help our housing shortage. Yeah. And we, you know, we had a, a what a train, uh, a rescheduling of the train that, that they had tried out for a while there after years of talking about, you know, decades of talking about it. And uh, then the pandemic hit and, you know, and I don't know how popular it was to begin with, but there's yeah. something about our our commuter transportation system, whether it's MTD or uh, you know anything more regional. Is uh, I hear people, you know, complaining a lot about yeah. how it's not convenient. No, it's true. I so I worked at the, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland for for twelve years, and I lived in a little area called Shaker Heights, but it was on a little light rail system, and I never drove to work once. I took the light rail. It was fabulous. I mean. You just walk over there, get on, you know, get off downtown and, you know, it's so easy, simple, but it's funny. So, um, so it turns out that you so saw when I was there that the ridership started to fall a little bit. I'm not quite sure why. And then uh, the public transportation people said, well, ridership's falling. So we're going to cut the amount of trains because we can't <laughs> afford it. <laughs> so I'm like, now ridership's going to fall even more because now it's not convenient anymore. Now it's like if you miss the eight o'clock train, you know you're stuck for an hour and a half. <laughs> right. It's like I said, you know, make it more frequent, and then more people will will come. You know, but so look, a lot of places have these issues. You know, I would have loved a little light rail system going 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 south. Um, and I I do think that there's some some big opportunities. You know, I was just in Lompoc. Uh, and, you know, thinking about Space Force and, and, you know, SpaceX and all these things, they're looking at expansion up there. 
they're facing the same thing. They're really, there's really not much housing up there. Mm. So, you know, if we could develop some of those areas, you know, provide busing. I think, you know, that like the Chumash provide busing for, for their employees. You know, they, mm. they have a, you know, a natural gas bus that I think that goes to Santa Maria, goes to Lompoc, pick up their employees, you know, try to make it convenient. Um, and unfortunately, that's just, you know, if you can't afford to live in Santa Barbara, you know, what are your alternatives? Well, now, to me, the only alternative is to live a bit farther away yeah, for a while until we can get these things built. But then let's make it more convenient for them. You know, I would be very, I, I think it'd be a great idea for the city to come up with more or the county, you know, a much better bus system until we can figure things out. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Another thing I want to talk to you about was employment. So a while ago, when I was doing my reporting, my stories, small businesses, they say, we can't hire anyone. No one's taking our jobs. Uh, it's so hard to fill this. And we know during the pandemic, there was that thinking that, well, the unemployment benefits and they're extended and they're higher. And so there's no incentive for some of them to go back to work and, um, right. Where are we at with that? Are, are, is it easier now for these employers to hire people for these jobs, or is this still a problem? Well, okay, so it's it's gotten more complicated, I think. But you're right. I mean, you know, it was kind of the first time. You know, if you go back to the pandemic, you know, we started to see you know more job job openings and unemployed people. You know, and so it was very easy to find a job. But I think the benefits, like you mentioned. You know, and this is my hope that people were like, you know, I was in a job that really was going nowhere. You know, I was getting minimum wage and I was, it was going nowhere. I could go back to that job, but you know what? I'm going to sit it out. Yeah. I'm going to hopefully get a better job, maybe get a little more education, get some more skills, you know, and then I want to find a job that's going to lead me to, you know, higher growth in the future rather than, you know, a minimum wage job, you know, that, that, you know, really has no growth potential. So, I think my biggest hope is that that kind of happened and people are now going to find jobs that are better suited for them and for the employer. And, you know, it's just a better match overall, which is beneficial for both people. So, you know, that's my hope. The problem now is that we're starting to see a bunch of layoffs. Mm. So the, the, the amount of job openings, you know, in the U S has, has fallen, you know, not a lot, but it's fallen. Um, on the other hand, unemployment is the lowest it's been the unemployment rate in Santa Barbara County since we had collected data going at least back to 1990. You know, we were a little under 3%. Now it's about 3%. Never seen that before. So it seems people have jobs that want them, you know? So, and by the way, you know, what's going to happen is the unemployment has to rise. It's, it, it's never been 3% or 2.8%. So, you know, that's not going to be something that should be like, oh my God, unemployment rates rising, you know, the, sort of the rate that we've seen historically, you know, about four or four and a half percent, you know, we could expect it to go back to there at some point. Um, but again, you know, if, if people are getting more education, more skills, you know, that's going to benefit us in the, in the long run. But for now, like I said, people still are having a hard time hiring and then a whole bunch of other firms are laying people off. Right. So, yeah. Some of these large employers, these tech companies, um, I've seen, seen some of that as well. Maybe. So I have a question for you. If, if, so I know that the Google, you know, that Amazon, you know, and Alexa on, on state street, and then you read that, you know, Alexa is like very costly for, for Amazon. Have you heard any, I haven't heard of any layoffs in, in there, but that was yeah. an Alexa shop, I think. Yeah, I mean, they have that big building. This is what is it? The old Saks Fifth Avenue building yeah. that they did. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of them are. Uh, well, I would just say, as a reporter, Amazon's pretty secretive uh, in terms of finding out details, in terms of day to day reporting on their inner workings. So yeah. uh, they can be right. They 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 don't need to work with the local media to be transparent about their businesses. Right, like right. Other companies. So um, I haven't heard that. I I do think that a okay. lot of the, employees are probably working remotely um still um i don't know how much is going on at that yeah. point um you know one of the but things you mentioned but the, but, yeah 
No, go ahead. Well, I was going to transition to tourism um, um, and, and the airport. You mentioned how busy the airport was last week during yep. uh, Thanksgiving. Um, so, so people are wanting to come to Santa Barbara still, and there's travels. The airport's doing great. Can you give us a little bit on um, on sort of that part of the economy? Yeah, I mean, you know, the airport's just been you know climbing, climbing, climbing in, in terms of volume, and you know, last week the Thanksgiving week set a record all-time record for most people coming through Santa Barbara Airport. Mm. Um, on the other hand, last week was a disaster for hotels, relatively speaking. Oh. So super curious. Um, you know, I, up until then, you know, hotels have also been setting records, you know, especially in terms of average daily rates. You know, when you see in Santa Barbara average daily rate, you know, $400 or something like that, um, you know, it's just crazy. Um you know, on, on the other hand, you know, and, and they were pretty full, but last week they, you know, they weren't. And so, you know, maybe people were staying with more families, you know, maybe these were people who would live in Santa Barbara, who were coming back, who were traveling. Uh, but, but again, I, I still think the pandemic is, you know, is kind of, you know, screwing up how we're trying to view some of these, some of these data. Um, so, uh, but yeah, they, you know, I think people want to be here. Uh, they always will. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, the average daily rate is certainly going to have to come back a little bit, and it has fallen, fallen some. But, you know, hotels are doing great in Santa Barbara. Yeah, what a great industry where you can just increase <laughs> the amount you charge people depending on the season or the demand. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can rack, mm -hmm. you, know, you can turn it down too if it's unsuccessful. Right. But a lot of these increases year over year over TOT taxes is, is not necessarily because of the full hotels, but it's it's the increase in the uh, amount, the average daily rate, you know, that people are right. paying. And so exactly, it's just a response, a real time live response to the market. I guess yes, for sure, for sure. And you know, you mentioned tax revenues. Um, so it's, it's something's you know super interesting. So again, I looked at you know Ventura and, and San Luis Obispo. Uh, sorry, I looked at uh, uh, Santa Maria and um, uh, um, and Ventura and the city of Santa Barbara, and I looked at kind of tax revenues, overall tax revenues. I didn't break them down. So the most astounding thing to me there is so Santa Barbara's tax revenues, I think in twenty one were something like four hundred million, something like that. Um, but then I, I looked at, you know, tax revenue per capita. So per person, what that looks like. And, you know, Santa Barbara's is like 4,000 something per person. Santa Maria is like 2,000. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, uh, and Ventura is like 2,000. Oh. So, you know, to me, it has to kind of reflect housing prices, you know, how much revenue we're getting, um, but it's just one of those, uh, again, it's kind of crazy differences, how much more, you know, revenue per person we get in Santa Barbara than in these other cities. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. What's what's ahead here? I mean, we're talking about um, inflation going up. We're talking about living wage going up, but not at the rate of what things cost. And so we're getting poorer. Uh, we're not in a recession now, but we're, we're headed there, I guess, uh, What's your outlook? Like I, yeah, I, I made a joke the other day at the county. You know, it's like, I don't think we're not in a recession right now. I don't believe. Um, and then people ask me, are we heading towards one? And my answer is, well, if we're not in one, we have to be heading towards one, right? <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, they just, it's a natural phenomenon that just kind of keeps happening, you know, every once in a while. Um, and, you know, there's no doubt about it. So, no, you're right. You know, inflation's, you know, it, that's going to be pretty hard not to crack, to be honest. Um, I think the Fed, and the reason is to me, is that the Fed got behind the curve early on. And if you go back and look at statements from the Federal Reserve, um, you know, during the pandemic, you know, what they keep saying is, you know, this is transitory. These are supply chain issues due to the pandemic. You know, as soon as the pandemic is, you know, subsides, you know, it, it'll all be fine. So they said that probably for a year and a half. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, what's the definition of transitory again? You know, how, how long does it have to be high? 
And then they're like, okay, now we got to do something. And so, you know, so, so then they started saying, okay, you know, now we have to make sure that we haven't lost credibility. Mm. And so, you know, and what they did was they said, look, we're going to be very transparent about this. You know, we're going to be raising rates, you know, probably higher than we have, uh, you know, every meeting, 75 basis points uh, for a while. And, you know, and so they, they did that and we're starting to see inflation come down a little bit. So, you know, I, I think now that they've told people that inflation is going to be high for a while and they're going to keep raising interest rates, you know, until they see, until they get down to, you know, three, four percent inflation um, and their targets two percent. But, you know, they rarely hit that target. Yeah, let me ask you a, a kind of a micro local question here. And I didn't ask you ahead of time. You know, I didn't suggest I would be bringing this up. So we'll see where it goes. <laughs> uh, but okay. I just thought of it right now as we're talking about uh, tax revenue. Um, you were at that meeting and you heard uh, the, the county CEO talking about the benefits of the cannabis revenue. But at the same time, uh, we know that cannabis revenue is much lower than it was when it began. And there's a saturation on the market and it's what, you know, a little more than a million bucks or something. And so um, yeah. from an economist perspective, um, is cannabis the is it going to save the county is it saving the county in some little ways or is it a bust from your perspective well i mean you know before cannabis there were you know cut flowers right and you know so you know we were, we were kind of leading the world in cut flowers and you know did that save santa barbara well no, it's, it's, it didn't save santa barbara but it's certainly you know you need that revenue um you know the cannabis issue you know, unfortunately, I think that the projections, um, it, it's hard to, you know, I don't forecast, right? I run the forecast project, but I forecast, but, you know, it's really hard to think about, you know, how, um, you, you know, how that's going to move forward. And, and I, I wrote this thing a while back. And, and if you look at the, uh, I worked with the legislative analyst office a little bit, um, in California, you know, I, I think the tax structure was crazy how they were taxing cannabis. Um, and, you know, my view is, you know, most, most politicians are like, you know, Hey, that's a really good thing to tax. Let's tax it, you know? And, and so I think many people thought that there was, it's an economics term it's called inelastic demand. You know, that if you yeah. tax it, people are still going to be buying about the same amount. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think that's true. I, I think we're seeing that. And I, I think one thing that we did, did wrong, um, not just the county, but the state, for example, um, I, I think we we misunderstood the the substitutes that were available for cannabis, and I think we've seen you know a, kind of an explosion in the, the illegal market, you know, and so you know so what happens is once you legalize it, it's like okay, um, they're not going to know where I got it. Ah, you know what I mean? so so now it's legal and i can kind of have it and smoke it and no one's going to be yelling at me and you know I, ha I haven't done this it's a very hard thing to do but i think there's some you know the substitution and i do believe that you know if we can lower the the, the cost of cannabis um and get rid of the black market you know that would save a lot it would save a lot of police time police money um, and if you, if you think about it, I mean, you're probably not old enough to go back to the prohibition probably, but, um, you know, so people were dying because they were drinking, you know, bad alcohol. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so now, you know, so now once it's, once it's legal, I think, you know, people would want to say, look, I want it to be safe. I want to know the strain I'm smoking. I want to know, you know, the, the potency of it, just like we do with alcohol now. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we go, you, you, you go to, a, you know, a microbrewery and it says what the alcohol level is on it. Yeah. It's, it. You know what I mean? So, you know, so I think people, you know, they really like consistency and, you know, it's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, Budweiser is like the biggest selling beer in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so one reason for that, that, that happened is it's very consistent. 
you know when you buy a, a six pack of Budweiser, you know exactly what it's going to taste like. Right. You know, if you're a small shop and you're trying to do, you know, wine or beer or cannabis, you know, it's kind of random. It's mm-hmm. like, well, this batch kind of turned out bad, you know, <laughs> and, you know, okay. So, so, so I, I think, you know, we're still seeing in, in both those areas, cannabis, microbreweries, wineries, et cetera, you know, those industries get shaken out over time, right? I mean, if you go back to the 1800s, there was something like three or 400 breweries in the U.S. And then over time, they got bought out. There, mm-hmm. By the 1950s, there was like four. Yeah. And now we're seeing an explosion of, of small breweries. Um, and then some get taken over, like, you know, Firestone Walker, you know, bought by a, a foreign company, most of it. And we're still experimenting with, with cannabis, right? What that what that market's going to look like. So, of course, there's going to be some shaking out. But here is where I think the government should really say, you know what? Um, we want to get rid of the illegal market. So right now, if you buy legal cannabis, it's like almost twice as expensive, I think, as illegal cannabis, something like that. Mm-hmm. And a large part of that is due to due to taxes. Yeah. So I think we should seriously think about how to get rid of the illegal market, which would be a benefit to everybody, the people mm-hmm. who smoke. You know, now you're getting consistent, you know, you know, the strain yeah. police would be, you know, you don't have to go on these raids, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. so I think we should really work hard on, on thinking seriously how to, how to tax, you know, something like cannabis. Yeah, definitely. What they call it a, a sin tax or you know, maybe they don't call it that because we're not, you know, can't, there's nothing wrong with cannabis in the eyes, you know, so you can't call it a sin. Right. But, right. Um, yeah, you know, the idea, well, people want it so bad, they'll pay anything for it is not right. true. And then, you know, you hear from people um, who say, wow, it's so much stronger than it used to be when I used to, you know, get it from whoever they got it from, right. from right. Friend or something like that. And of course, the the, the, the cost of it as well. Um, I guess what gas is the only thing we're going to pay, you know, whatever we need to. Uh, that's the only right. thing, you know, like... I, I was in high school when it was 99 cents, right? That's how much it was, 99 cents a gallon. And you, if I ever thought back then, it'd be, you know, 599 or whatever it can right. be, you know, right. six or what, seven, what it was for a little while there. But it's like, you have no choice. You have to put gas you in your no car. Choice. You know, I mean, you exactly. can sure you, if you have no kids or no groceries or you're just going for yourself, you can ride your bike. But, you know, right, if right. you have stuff and places to go you need your car so yeah, yeah that's, that's right. interesting that's one right. to see how it'll shake out and i wonder if anyone will ever admit uh, they're wrong if anyone will say you know we we overestimated we messed up and we need to change how, how we look at this that's hard for government right. i guess well i you know and it's not so much maybe they were wrong or maybe they were you know i think they were you know overly optimistic by, by misunderstanding you know what that substitution effect looks like that yeah. that you know you know i think they thought that okay if everything stays the same here's our projection but i think things didn't stay the same i don't think they really understood the tax effect what was that what that was going to do to the price um and you know we're very very hopeful but you know i, I you know my view is i mean as again it's kind of an economics thing but you know if you look at revenue you know, revenue is the amount of things sold times the price. So if the amount of things sold stays the same and you raise the price, obviously revenue goes up. But if something's very elastic, that is very price responsive, if you lower the price, you get so many more people buying it that revenue actually goes up, right? And so I think this is one of those cases. um, We don't really know what that number looks like, but I think it's one of these cases that, you know, if you make it cheap enough, we'll get rid of the black market and, and sales will actually go up and probably revenue. Yeah. So it's to me, it's just something. It's not that they were wrong. I just think they didn't really understand, you know, what was happening there. So. Yeah. All right. Well, Peter Ruper, I really appreciate this conversation, uh, shedding light on so many of these important topics and your expertise is like no one else. So thanks a lot for. <laughs> for taking time and explaining all these you got it josh i love the program and uh you know thanks very much for having me on 
All right. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. All right. Take care. Take care.